Welcome, everybody. It's uh, 1800 Central European time, and it's time for Let's Talk Cardano with me, Peter, the founder and CEO of Orgfax. And so, yeah, I'm very honored and um, uh, proud to be asked to uh, uh, basically uh, represent the masterclass that I did at the Cardano Summit in Dubai. It was very successfully received, and I think there was a lot of people interested in what I had to say as far as some new information about a new type of product available on uh, Cardano blockchain. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about that today. And I think to start with, um, not everybody is familiar with the idea of what an Oracle is. So I'm going to talk to you about using our uh, decentralized Oracle feeds and our project name is Orcfax. And so Orcfax is an Oracle. And so what is an Oracle? Well, the name itself uh, goes all the way back to ancient times. And it was like people that would channel messages from the gods to the mortals. And it's now become like a, a, a metaphor for a type of thing in the blockchain industry where uh, it's a mechanism that uh, interprets real world data and formats it into a type of format that smart contracts uh, in blockchain smart contracts can understand. And so that's what we refer to as an Oracle, something, a primitive, a mechanism, a tool, uh, a module, a piece of software, a product, a platform that goes out into the real world and looks around and says, these things have happened and I will put it in a data format and put it on chain so that a smart contract can use it. And for hopefully most of you that are listening to this podcast today are familiar with, you know, like uh, decentralization, Web3, blockchain, DeFi, this idea of a smart contract being this kind of deterministic uh, chunk of code that sits on chain waiting to execute. Um, and by deterministic, it means it will always do the same thing every single time and have the same outputs given the same similar inputs. Um, once it's on chain, it's immutable. It can't be changed. And that's the, that's the power of smart contracts. That's the power of Web3 DeFi is this immutability and this decentralization and trustlessness. But um, what is um, not really well understood is that many of the really cool DeFi products that we're seeing out there in the world, including on, on Cardano and other blockchains, um, where there are hundreds of millions of dollars being traded every day um, in these DeFi instruments, whether it's, you know, like stop loss orders or yield farming or, or other kinds of like loan contracts or all kinds of fancy DeFi instruments that we've been seeing over the last couple of years. Um, there's hundreds of millions of dollars of of money being exchanged in those transactions. But there is a, a fundamental core problem that is, in our opinion, in my opinion, is not being looked at closely enough. And that's what's being called the Oracle problem. And so what is the Oracle problem? Well, those deterministic smart contracts that sit on chain waiting for some kind of input from a, you know, what we're saying is what we call an Oracle, it takes outside data and inputs it to the smart contract. In many cases, a lot of DeFi projects are running their own private internal oracles. Like in other words, just their own data feed. It's like, hey, my smart contract needs to know what the price of ADA is. If it changes, then we might do a stop loss order or we might do um, you know, take profit order. And so let's have a thing checking for the ADA price. And when it changes, we'll feed it to our smart contract. But that creates a new layer that, that, that creates some centralization and some, some trust in this third party that if you're using this DeFi platform to do whatever you're doing, some, some lending, some whatever yield farming, um, you're trusting their feed to give accurate information. And it, it really goes back to that trust me bro kind of idea. It's like, it's like, yeah, you've got this decentralized DeFi product, but it's relying on a third party giving data from the outside world and feeding it in, which obviously creates... A, uh, a huge like uh, security uh, uh, attack vector because if you can change that data in any way, you can use it in your favor to trigger to get the smart contract to do things you want it to do based on false input data. And that in a nutshell is the Oracle problem. That really is like, how can we trust the data that comes into our smart contracts to be authentic and accurate and trustworthy um, when we are trying to create a trustless system? And the other, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but like that, that is, you know, for me right now, I think um, that is the main issue. So um, Orgfax is now a new Oracle service provider on the Cardano network. The other um, Oracle service provider that um, has feeds available, it's called Charlie 3. And we're currently the only two production ready, Cardano ready Oracles um, on the Cardano blockchain. So this first point, I mean, it's, I'm not pointing fingers. It's the fact that most projects that got started on Cardano did not have the option to use a decentralized Oracle feed for their um, smart contracts, but now they do um, since there's now two viable um, Oracle options for them to integrate. So I think first and foremost, that is the biggest part of what we would call the Oracle problem. Um, the other ones for, that we see from Orcfax is this idea of uh, reliances on single sources of truth or what, what you might call a re relay parrot, where it's like, 
You've got one thing, only one source of truth, reporting some information, reporting some data, and Oracle comes and grabs it and reformats it and reposts it without doing any kind of additional kind of like uh, validation or verification of that information. And um, I'll talk about that in a minute, but our way of handling that is, is by doing what we call data triangulation is making sure that we collect data from more than one primary source to confirm that the data that we're looking at is authentic and accurate. Um, so we, yeah, that's another thing that us, us as an Oracle provider, we, we are focused a lot on is like eliminating the single sources of truth. Um, the other one is just basic good engineering. Like there's just like a lot of like network security you've got to get right to um, minimize the man in the middle tax. And all that is, is just somebody figuring out somewhere to get in your architecture, somewhere in the middle of the stack and insert some false data. So how do you, limp, how do you make sure that people are not able, how can you suss that out? <laughs> and in many cases, we've solved that problem in a lot of ways in blockchain. The problem of like, are you looking at the same data that I'm looking at um, by using this distributed like consensus technology? And so, um, but the problem is that um, a lot of the DeFi platforms still aren't that as decentralized as they should be. And that allows for civil attack, a civil attack meaning like a 50 plus one where somebody can, can take control of the network or the protocol by simply owning most of the controlling interest, uh, 50 plus one interest. And so, and, and that, just, it, that just points the finger at that, whatever that platform is, isn't decentralized enough. The other thing that we're seeing a lot with the Oracle problem, in my, in my opinion, our opinion, is that there's a, still a lot of off-chain, like know your customer and anti money laundering um, kind of requirements for people to even use like Oracle feeds. So like, hey, you want to use Oracle feeds, like go through this very like, you know, web to off-chain kind of process to go through this legal agreement. And now you've created all kinds of like phishing attack and regulatory interference kind of issues as well around that. And there's definitely some, uh, I think, hiccups and stalls along the way in rolling out Oracles in, in, in web three related to all of this. And then last but not least, um, and this is one of my biggest uh, issues with uh, this particular problem domain, is, is poor data management and record keeping does not allow for verification. So what, that, what I'm trying to say with that is that um, oracles will report data on-chain, um, on-chain contracts, smart contracts will do things with it, potentially with, with worth millions of dollars. And then after the fact, it's, you can't go back and say, hey, this, this, this multi-million dollar DeFi instrument that just triggered the data that it was based on, can we please have a look at where that data came from? Can we verify? Is there some audit logs to talk about that, how the data was collected and it's stored? And, um, and can we go back and have some traceability and audibility um, for verification, whether for just, you know, for, for business interest or whether something went uh, afoul? Um, there should be some kind of audit logs being kept of like how data is being gathered and collected. So that that is like I, I, that's not a nutshell. That's a really long list of all the things that I would characterize as the Oracle problem. These are all things that we're trying to address with the um, with the the Orcfax Oracle platform. And so um, I'll spend a little minute talking about that. Um, I am aware that there is a Q and A um, Q and A going. So uh, please, oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, somebody's already asked uh, whether I can elaborate on the security measures that Orcfax implements to protect its Oracle feeds from manipulation or external threats. Hundred percent. In fact, I'll talk about that right now. Um, so, um, first and foremost, like we're calling ourselves. Oops, did I just change the slideshow? Um, first and foremost, like you know, we call ourselves a decentralized Oracle, and 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 what we mean by that is that. Um, the data gathering and the data validation um, are all happening in uh, decentralized validator network pools. And so um, let's start at the beginning. So we live in space and time. So this is what does an Oracle do? Um, we as humans, we live in a four dimensional grid, three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. And when anything happens in that four dimensional grid, we would call that an event. And that's what an Oracle reports on. So that's the domain of an Oracle is the real world, what's happening in the real world. And so the types of events that we might be interested in and most of the types of things we've seen oracles do up until now in the DeFi space is reporting on like currency price pairs as a good example like did the price of uh ada uh, related uh, vis-a-vis us dollars did it did it change in the last hour and, and if so what's the new price and that's that's a thing that happened in the real world <clears throat> People are buying and selling ADA in the real world. And as they do, they're offering a different price. And we have different um, exchanges like um, making those deals and recording them on chain. And the accumulation of those deals in any given hour, minute, second, you add them all up together, you do a mean average, you actually get a price. So the, the actual event, like the ADA USD price fee that we have is actually a culmination of all the ADA USD sales that are happening on the centralized exchanges that we're looking at. And, and creating an average out of that. 
And so similarly, other kinds of real world events that oracles would report on is let's say a sporting event. So let's say you have a betting application that's on chain, has a smart contract, it's more trustless because you don't have to trust some like casino operator in who knows where that tells you things are happening. You can actually see things happening on chain. And the smart contract might sit there with a betting app, for example, that says, hey, if uh, Manchester United wins this game by two goals, then it will pay out this much to your to your betting, uh, uh, the wallet that you use to get into this betting smart contract. And so it sits there and waits and waits and waits. And then finally, an Oracle will come and say, hey, the game is over and this is the score and it reports it. And then somebody somebody wins a bet, somebody loses a bet. Um, and so then other kinds of real world events could be like um, weather. So uh, really interesting things we're starting to see Oracles uh, be able to offer is some kind of like uh, extreme weather insurance. So um, insurance payout for extreme weather events, uh, especially as with climate change, they're getting more and more uh, um, frequent and um, urgent. And quite often the people that are like, for example, farmers that have their fields flooded have to sit around for, for months waiting to get a payout from the insurance company. What an on-chain uh, insurance contract can do is to say, hey, if there was an extreme weather event in this particular geographic area where you happen to own this like policy, if there's flooding or whatever else would be being reported, boom, your insurance claim will get paid out instantly. You don't have to wait for an adjuster, all the rest of it. And the, it, that is just one example of many where, of course, where blockchain can kind of disintermediate traditional industries. But it's a good example of where oracles are really important and maybe overlooked and people don't think about that, that in order to trigger something cool like an on-chain insurance um, smart contract, you need to have reliable off-chain data. And how can you make that data reliable? How can we make sure it's secure? How can we make sure it hasn't been manipulated? So that is an obsession of ours. And I think it's an obsession of any Oracle builder. There are, like I said, Charity 3 works on uh, creating an Oracle in the Cardano space as well. Other L1 blockchains have Oracle providers on them as well. And all for all of us, this is like, you know, the key, the, the burning question. How do we solve the Oracle problem? How can we um, have your DAP, your platform, your protocol, take in data from us that you can trust or get to the point where you believe it's trustless. You don't have to trust us anymore. You trust the technology, you trust the procedure, you trust the process to deliver authentic, accurate data. So here we go. This is part, this is how we've tackled this in, in the org fact space. First and foremost, we've kind of developed this principle, what we call triangulated data collection. And by simply what we mean by that is that um, we avoid any situation where uh, there's only a single source of truth. And so, you know, um, where it's, you know, we've been asked in some cases to like, hey, can you um, be an Oracle verification service for the data we're getting from this API? And we can say, okay, great, but where where's the other two sources of that data? If there's only a single source and we're repackaging it and saying, yes, we bless and we repurpose it, we haven't really done our job as like, in my opinion, our opinion, as an Oracle service that's going through and validating and um, verifying that data is as accurate and authentic as it can be. So a very simple principle we have is, is trying to get, so by that we mean at a bare minimum, collect data from at least three sources. So this is a very basic GPS type principle, this idea that if you can have three different things looking at the same thing from different points of view, then you should be able, if they're all seeing the same thing, then that, that thing is probably real or that, you know, in GPS is like, that is your location, three different satellites have picked up where you are. And we use the same principle and, you know, this is the same kind of thing that's, you know, in, in his, his historiography and even like, you know, if you think about legal evidence, those kind of things, um, the more evidence you have, obviously the more, the more reliable your information is. So in our case, in a simple example that let's start with the A to USD price feed, we make sure that we collect that data from a minimum of three centralized exchanges. We're about to bump that up to quite a few more actually. But again, the, the principle is that whatever kind of data feed OrgFax will provide, we will always make sure there's at least three primary sources, uh, meaning like three unique sources that are not um, copying from each other that have their own unique source of data. Um, and so, yeah, in this, for, in the case of an A to USD price feed, that means going to different centralized exchanges, more, three or more that have their own order book that are primary sources that are buying and selling ADA and are reporting live on that data. Like that's a primary source. Um, we are also working on, um, our next pro So we're going to make some more, um, centralized exchange price feeds data available shortly as free, uh, as free Oracle feeds, including ADA to BTC and ADA to Euro. And then the next product we're really interested in uh, delivering um, and getting a lot of interest from potential integrators is a Cardano native token uh, feed. So like, tell us what the price is of world mobile token today, of Empower token. Um, you know, we, I think a lot of us rely on some other tools in, in, the, in, the, in, our, in our ecosystem, in a kind of ecosystem, but 
we truly don't have like a proper um, decentralized Oracle feed telling us what those prices are. So as a good example of our triangulation data principles, what, what we do there is we have a minimum of three full Cardano nodes, each reading every Cardano block transaction, and then looking at the decentralized exchanges, buying and selling tokens for every single block. And so we have at least three full nodes looking at that data, collecting it, and then bringing it into the validation pool to see, are we looking at the same thing? So that's another good example of like what I would consider, you know, when I said primary source, at least five, three primary sources for a centralized exchange, where, you know, we're looking at Kraken, KuCoin, Binance, et cetera. And for the case of doing a Cardano native token, uh, the primary source would be a completely independent full Cardano node with a full copy of the blockchain and each one check in their own full copy of the blockchain saying, are we looking at the same thing? So that's what we mean by triangular data collection. The other example would be for like sports scores. Like, so if you want to rely on sports scores, you can go to like an API, there's several APIs and there's more than one. So we would look at three or more um, sports stats providers and look at their APIs. If there's three that we can compare, great. Um, but there, for example, where this whole idea of triangulation is getting more and more interesting and something in long term that we're looking at with OrgFax is how to have human agent gathered information. So for example, what if we could have people that are in the stadium um, taking uh, photographs of the scoreboard with trusted devices that have firmware that, that, that uh, you can trust the timestamps um, and then collecting that data as a way of triangulating data and figuring out what's going on in the real world. And I think that will get us to a point where, you know, we can use an Oracle as something even more sophisticated than just spinning up price feeds, like really becoming like a truth verification system for the real world. And that's something that long term we're very interested in with doing org facts. But you know, that's 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 the long term. Short term right now, I think the main role of an Oracle like org facts is simply giving reliable, accurate, um, trustless price feeds. And my trustless meaning is you don't have to trust us. You can trust our process that the data that we've gathered is is decentralized. So to start with in that in that left side triangulated data collection, we for the aided USD price feed, we go to at least three different centralized exchanges. And then we have, um, we're working on now, we're just launching an incentivized testnet to test this technology. Um, currently, we're just we're running our own validator node at the moment. Um, but when the whole system goes live on mainnet, um, after the incentivized testnet, what we will have is stake-based validation. So what happens is we have the collect nodes collecting the data, normalizing it, turning it into a certain format. And then we go into like a, a stake-based validation pool. Like, and again, like a distributed Byzantine tolerant, like blockchain type validation pool that goes around and says, hey, you saw this, you saw this, you saw, are we all looking at the same thing? If so, the information must be consistent and reliable. If not, there might be some red flags. Do we need to go back and look at it? Is Or is it that bad that this information, something is going on and we don't trust it. Let's just shut it down and we're not actually gonna to go to publication. We're not gonna put this on chain at all. And I think that there was an early question that came up is like, that's really two of the primary ways that we you know, ensure that the data is accurate. It's like, first of all, collect it from more than one place. And if one of those places gives you weird data, whether it's, because there's a network error, or maybe there is potentially some fraud going on, you know, that should get flagged then when you compare it to the data from to at least two other sources. The other thing that we do, in fact, is also, um, right now we're running this collecting uh, network ourselves right now as a, as, as, as a, uh, to, to get up and running in the stage one. And we make sure that each server is in a geographically dispersed area of the world so that even, even though we're hitting the same uh, centralized exchanges for their price data, we've got a one server doing it from Thailand and one doing it from Amsterdam and one so forth. Because the other thing to think about is that um, especially in the days of these days of CDNs, um, you might be getting different data depending where you are. So we want our Oracle to be aware of that as well. It's like, hey, did, did this thing, did this, did this API tell it the same information to the server requesting it from Thailand that than the server from Amsterdam? So we check, we double check that. We double, then we um, run like a, a normalization to like normalize the data because the data is different from each place. And then um, we run a calcul mean calculation and then we pass it around the validation pool. And we say state-based validation because this is really where um, we will have, we envision like a, a network pool of um, different node operators, um, you know, up to like potentially hundred or so. Um, and um, those, those node operators will be, um, will be running the Orfax software. They'll be collecting the data and their nodes will be running this validation algorithm. And we'll be randomly, first of all, the validation algorithm within the validator pool network will just determine that we all agree that the data we see is actually valid. So it's authentic and accurate. We're ready to pass it on, have it published. And then one of those um, nodes will get randomly nominated to actually uh, pr produce the, the fact, what we call the fact statement. So the actual data that we're interested in, in this case, let's say ADA USD price. Um, and that's all stake based, meaning that if you participate in this node and somehow your node gives false information or it breaks down technically, then 
the stake that you would have put up, the token that you, the tokens you would have invested to run this node um, would potentially get slashed. But if you're a good participant and you help produce good data and publish good fact statements and validate and there's no issues, you get rewarded every round. Every time a fact statement is published, you get your share of a reward for the, the fee that's being paid to publish that fact statement. And that's what we mean by stake-based validation. So a validator pool network, um, we're running an incentivized testnet over six months, starting in January. We've got um, a Discord right now where we've been talking to uh, potential um, testers, and we're getting that up and running. And that's very exciting stuff that is really going to be the focus of our R&D over the next few months. Um, but then, yeah, we get as far as the fact statement publication. So then we, we create this like datum that says, yes, the ADA to USD price right now is, what, I don't know what it is today. It's been doing very well the last week. Um, let's say, let's just say 40 cents for a second. And so that that datum goes in goes inside a Cardano UTXO or Cardano um, transaction, uh, an unspent transaction output, um, the the core thing that gets passed around the Cardano blockchain blockchain, and, and includes space for reference inputs and datum, and that's where we put our actual datum. And once it goes onto the blockchain as a as a Plutus transaction, on chain smart contracts can now go to that um, that address for that transaction, and they can go look in the datum, and they can use that datum to then do interesting things on chain, like execute a DeFi contract or a betting app or whatever, what have you. And that's in an, and and all of these things, um, all of those actions, uh, again, are decentralized in the sense that you can check out what Orkfax is publishing and doing by looking at independent Cardano nodes and block explorers. And then this is the thing I think that makes Orgfax somewhat unique. And um, depending on how much time we have today, I can show off a little bit of this stuff. But I think what's really interesting and cool um, about uh, what we've done with, with um, Orgfax is that we make sure that there's reliable um, audit trails of, of, all, the, of all the data um, gathering. So everything that's happened in this chain of events leading up to the publication um, generates a number of audit logs. So if we go hit a, uh, if, we go to, if we go to Kraken and says, hey, Kraken, what's the price for ADSD right now? we're gonna get an HTTP response from the API. Those raw HTTP responses are captured and archived. The, the code that's run to validate and create the mean average is, is, is snapshot and, and, and captured. And all of that's put into an, an auto package trail that is stored on the Arweave decentralized storage network. So Arweave is a similar type of like decentralized storage platform like IPFS or Filecoin, which many people are familiar with. Cool thing, again, decentralized storage, you're not relying on like Google or Microsoft or, or Amazon to give you access to their storage data farms. Um, this is a completely decentralized network. Um, one really cool thing about Arweave that I've liked a lot as given my background as an archivist is that it allows for a storage endowment, meaning that you pay once to store the data on the decentralized network and you never have to worry about keeping that data pinned or alive or paying contracts to keep it on chain. And um, the work we did on... Um, moving these data packages onto Arweave, uh, we found was like actually could use a generic API of its own and make it available as a service to other Web3 projects that need to maintain trustworthy immutable links between the data they put on chain and the documentation packages that it needs to point to. And this is true for almost any NFT, by the way. A lot of NFTs point to some IPFS address, but if somebody stops pinning that IPFS address or stops paying the pinning contract, that image will disappear. And that is not the case with Arweave. Um, and so, yeah, we're also building this interesting uh, Web3 service called Arc.io as, as an intermediary API for people that want to use the same service. But the point being is that this part piece of the puzzle takes all these audit logs and it bundles in it into an archival standards compliant package. And then you can either like download this packages yourself from independent Arweave nodes and gateways, or you can come use our Explorer, which is a way to make all of this more human readable because everything I've talked about up until now is very business to business backend, system to system. It's not really anything that a human visualizes, but we've created this really awesome Explorer to put on top of that so that you can trust but verify. You can go back to the facts. You can go, hey, uh, an hour ago, I had a DeFi smart contract that executed and it uses data. What, and it came, this data came from OrgFax. Why don't I have a look at where that data came from and how it was used? That, the Explorer allows you to do that. And I'll give you guys a little demo of that at the end. Um, how does Orkfax uh, feeds handle scalability and high transaction volumes on Cardano? So, um, I mean, we can't fight we can't fight block time. We live we all live within the Cardano block time. And the unique thing about the um, Orkfax um, design is that we designed it in a in a way to uh, minimize on on chain fees. So, like rather than relying on a lot of NFTs and all these other things, we've made basically boiled it down to. Uh, one transaction. So um, what, what what will happen is that the Orkfax, an Orkfax validator node, after it's gone through the data collection validation, will produce a, uh, e, a transaction 
with a uh, Orgfax authentication token to prove that it authentically came from Orgfax. And that transaction can be bundled with any number of other transactions in by the user of that transaction in the next block. So, and um, you can stack multiple transactions from that same transaction. So we're limited in the sense that we can publish fact statements, you know, every block, uh, every, you know, which is probably 20 seconds, right? Um, and um, we can, thanks to reference inputs, uh, the things that we got out of the Basel hard fork, more than one contract can access that, that data at the same time, but it has to be on chain first. So, you know, so we can handle scalability and high transaction volume in a sense as like, in a sense as, as, as much as Cardano can handle any number of dApps going to read the same data from the same UTXO at the same time. And that really, you know, that's a fundamental protocol limitation. Like that's how far that gets. Um, can you explain the process? Yes, definitely. I will talk about, sorry, that was my answer to the first question. And then I'm, I'm sorry, guys, I'm just reading the questions here. Can you explain the process of integrating Orphax? Definitely. I will talk about that a little bit further to the end, if you don't mind, just hanging in there a sec. Um, oops, I'll keep going off the slideshow. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean that, I just tried to give here a bird's eye overview of like what's happening in this platform. Like what is it, or what is it? Why does it keep doing that? That's silly. Okay. Um, sorry guys. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, uh, summarize again, just for a second here. Um, so we have the real world. We all live in the real world. You know, that's a very philosophical religious question as well. What is the real world? And, and I think that's actually why we spend a little bit of time actually defining it as a domain. Um, but stuff happens in the real world. And again, the most common thing that people think of oracles these days is they think of price feed. So let's talk about that. But what is a price feed? Like the price feed, like the price of ADA isn't just some fact that appears out of nowhere. It's based on real world events. And what, it, what it's based on is, is right now, as we're speaking, people are buying and selling ADA for US dollars on various exchanges. It's happening right now as we speak. And as people are doing that, those exchanges themselves take their order books and, and say, okay, for people are buying, selling a platform right now. And for whatever their heartbeat is, every millisecond, every second, every 10 seconds, they're reporting, they're reporting the price, the average price of what people are paying. And you know that's their order book. Um, and those are real world events. And so what Orcfax does is goes and collects that data and says, let's thank you very much. And we're going to average it. We're going to normalize it. And by normalizing, it means like you take data that's in different types of like formats or structures and you put it into a consistent systematic format. And so we do that in a both, a, we do that, we create, what, so we call them fact statements because we believe what we're doing is we're going out and actually establishing facts, things that are happening in the real world. So. A fact is like, you know, it's the temperature of in bank in, in Nairobi is is 35 degrees right now. Like the, the price of ADA is, is a fact because we've looked at all these different order books. And right now we can see that the price of ADA, one ADA um, was 0.24 USD on September 30th at that exact time. And that is a very simple fact statement. But you can imagine how these fact statements can get more complex once you start talking about things that are not price statements or sort of price feed uh, statements, starting with sports scores, for example. But going as far as like stating like, um, you know, extreme weather events or even things like, did this really happen? Did this person really say this? So we we're trying really hard to like create a generic platform that starts with um, decentralized storage price feeds, but like also allows for a structure that really can um, leverage a decentralized Oracle as, as a type of like tooth ver back verification kind of system. So, um, okay, again, like getting away from myself here, like the, but the very simple example is that we then take that fact statement and then that gets normalized into a format that a computer can understand. So we've standardized on using um, JSON LD, link data. Um, it's a very common data exchange format and link data is a way to make data markup uh, readable to other, to other machines and other programs. Um, and so our fact statements get turned into these uh, schema.org JSON LD statements. And then those get turned into CBOR because that's the actual language, the concise binary object representation format is the actual type of data format that lives on chain in the Cardano Pluto smart contract. And that's what it reads. So a nice pretty little human readable JSON and machine readable JSON gets turned into some CBOR and that goes on chain. And then if you look to the further right, you'll see that, that uh, this is like a little CBOR um, decoder. Um, you'll see somewhere in there, you'll see the bits and pieces of the, the far right, the bits and pieces of the data that actually get spit out and get read by an on-chain smart contract. And so to actually just uh, close my 
question windows, how is org facts? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, no new questions. So I'll carry on. Um, so yeah, so because somebody's asking, how do you actually integrate the feed? So great question. And in order to answer that question, um, we've developed a little uh, demo. And um, I should mention that um, if I haven't already, I might've gone through this very quickly, but currently there is one live um, OrcFax feed on Cardano mainnet um, that's giving an A to the USD price feed. And I'll give an example of one project that's integrated that already in a second after this. But what we've done here is we've created a little demo for um, um, Cardano uh, developers to uh, essentially take the Oracle for a spin and just kind of have a dummy app that like reads the data and, and then shows you how you could use that in your own app for, as an example. Um, so this is an open repo sitting in the OrgFax GitHub. Um, so come have a look if you like, if you're interested. Um, I believe there's a link to this slide deck later on. So all the links will be live in there. Um, and we've got pretty good instructions on how to get this um, stage, this scenario and this demo set up. Um, the thing is with uh, our case is that there is a bit of like, you know, we have to like, in order to run this demo, you need to seed some wallets. Um, and also because it's very important to the OrgFax um, actual design concept is that you also need to mint some uh, authentication tokens. So this script helps you mint some tokens that can act as an authentication token. And um, in the real world, a mainnet only, um, only OrgFax uh, nodes have the capability to issue those tokens. And that's the way that users of the data will verify that it's in fact coming from an authentic um, OrgFax uh, validator node. Um, and... Uh, pay it to you. So just to demonstrate that kind of like input, output, and reaction. And so, yeah, we mint some authentication tokens to begin with, and then um, it uh, it will read in the uh, OrgFax datum um, uh, from from the Oracle uh, chain. Sorry, sorry, they'll read the Oracle fax statement from the on-chain Cardano transaction. And, and so, um, Here's just, here's the, the environment stage already from the demo app with the various apps. So what we've done is we've already deposited some money in wallets. Um, and what we're doing right now is we're actually going back and generating some um, uh, authentication tokens. Let's see, so I'm just gonna roll back here a bit. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. um, so, the script here. So, and so I should mention, sorry, by the way, this is, we're using um, uh, Pi Cardano, which we absolutely love. It's an SDK for working with um, a Cardano off chain. And then there's a similarly, a, another Python um, library called option that lets you work with um, um, on-chain data using Python as the SD, SDK, inter SDK interface as well. So what we got here is a bunch of like sample Python scripts that set that that's in that demo repo I just showed you. And I just started running the, so I just funded a, a, a contract and now I'm running a little script that says, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna check to claim this script and see if it's reached the right price. And I want to claim those those uh, ADA from that address. So what it does, it's um, it uh, finds the Oracle smart contract address. It's it says, "Hey, how many UTXOs are there? Um, it double checks that they're in the valid time window. So the it, and we also garbage collect by the way. We get rid of old still ones. Um, this is all happening very quickly. But um, the script itself then is like is like spitting out some." Um, pretty print view of the seaboard that it read on chain to say, this is the data that I just read. Um, and so what we've actually done, okay, this is like, it's, it's really hard to actually demo this because it's so, um, it's happening all on chain. But um, one of the things uh, we've done just to make this demo easier is that um, right into this, in this little, so now we're just looking at the contract. This is the smart contract um, that we've developed for this demo written in Pi Cardano. And again, it's all sitting in that, um, in that repo for you guys to have a look at. And all we've done is like thrown in um, an, uh, an assert, like a, an, uh, an error check, um, just as a way of like outputting um, the data to show what we've got. Because if you recall, the, the actual data that lives on chain in, in, in the, in the EDU tech, so data is in this, is in this, this super format. And on top of that, the data that we use is also converted to scientific notation. So it takes it, and as long as you're on chain and working on chain with Plutus and other things, that's all fine and good. But sometimes you need to bring that data off. So there's there's a bit of conversion going back and forth, and we have a number of tools to help with that. 
So, and all we're doing in this right now in, in the demo is just to show off the, the point um, where you arrive. Oh, um, no. Is the point where you arrive at um, at that error. So what we're, so again, and it just runs really fast. So um, so we created the transaction, we signed a transaction, and then we just, that that little error code I showed you guys a second in, on GitHub is, is just kicked in. And so what it's done is saying, okay, we can go further, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hit an error right here, and I've been reading this on-chain data, and this is what I'm seeing. So this is now converting the C word back out to um, this uh, particular price data, and um, and instead of um, pushing it to uh, an error code, you, uh, you know, an a, a DAP developer could push that to their business logic and use that data and then to do whatever they're going to do, whatever it's a betting app or another kind of DeFi instrument. So. The, there's actually like a really, I know that was really quick and a little bit obscure. Um, we have, uh, we're really happy to have um, Sarah, uh, a new uh, DeFi protocol on um, Cardano has launched and they have actually using our mainnet um, ADA USD price feed in their app. Um, and they read it, they wrote, written an excellent um, uh, tutorial on for other devs on how they go about and in particular, um, how to parse the uh, seaboard data that goes on chain and how to use it in your contract. We are to be just a heads up. We are actually working on simplifying this even further to actually make this process even simpler. So we have a, the next version of the org facts, fact statement datum schema. And we're working on it hard right now with um, our contractors at M labs and our own team. Um, and we'll have that out very early in the new year. Um, nevertheless, um, uh, we are producing live, reliable um, ADA USD uh, price feed right now. And um, this project, other projects are beginning to use it, which is very exciting. Um, where does that leave us? Sorry. Um, yeah, I think that I'm looking at the time. I want to make sure I'm going to leave there's some good questions coming through ready. And I will get to each one, I promise. Um, but I think the... What I just shown you guys was like it's like it's not it doesn't make for a great demo because it's like hey we put data on chain and here's an app that just went and read it and we just put in a uh, an error check to spit out some errors so you can see that it's actually reading the data that's that's what just happened. Um, so oracles themselves are this very kind of abstract back end like business to business type application and it's not really a user facing type of thing but we. Again, I, I mentioned earlier that I believe that there's a much greater role for oracles to play than just providing price feeds. And I think when we get to that point, it'll be really good to have human readable interfaces on top of our fact statements. So what we've um, put some time and effort into to kind of bring this whole concept home is to produce what we call the uh, org fact explorer. So, I mean, most people in blockchain are familiar with the idea of like a block explorer. This is basically exactly the same thing. It's like every time that the org facts oracle publishes a fact on chain, it gets updated in the Explorer and you can search You can search for it by fact ID or other things. Now, this Explorer right now is very simple because it only has one active feed and that is our A to the USD price feed. But you can imagine over time as we start adding more feeds, this um, Explorer will become very handy for um, reviewing and auditing uh, existing facts. Now, what are we looking at? Okay, so um, this, for example, like uh, this, this, this is a fact statement, like I mentioned earlier, and that gets converted into JSON, gets converted into CBOR, and and then some app will read that. This is the human readable form of it. We're saying, okay, if you want, if you want to know what we reported on chain, this is exactly what we did. And so you can go. Um, for, so each time we do report, so right now um, the ADA USD uh, feed has a one hour heartbeat, meaning that on the hour, every hour, it reports the price unless there is a 1% deviation in the price and which which um, justifies an update to the boom. Oh, look at that, we're up to 0.6, nice going Cardano. Um, so if there's a 1% deviation, um, it will report as well. So that's what you're seeing here. So like you can see 525, five o'clock. So on the hour, four o'clock, three o'clock. And in between those times, you see that the price actually deviated by 1%. So then we will report as well. And so this is a free price feed. This datum is available for, um, uh, for um, developers to go um, just like Sarah has to like integrate their ADUSD price feed. And it's there, it's, it's pumping, it's, it's got a regular one hour heartbeat, 1% deviation, and those data are ready to be integrated into your smart contracts or into your smart contracts. Um, as a human, I, I'd be like, great, thanks very much. What am I looking at? So let me, let's, let's, I'll, um, I'll give you guys a little quick little tour of the Explorer and then we'll, I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll end it there and we can open it up for some Q and A before it's all over. 
Um, so um, here is a fact statement. Um, as I mentioned before, the, you know, the oracles are making statements of fact about the real world. And this is a fact statement we're making about the price of ADA. Um, and here, what you see here is that uh, an archival package. So what I didn't really get into very much is my own professional background. I am actually what's called a digital archivist. I've worked for the last 20 years in the space of uh, digital archiving, digital preservation, helping like extra government organizations like the World Bank and NATO and United Nations and federal governments and federal archives and state archives, and university archives and libraries, figure out how to keep their data, their, their documents, their records that are legal business records that have to be maintained, accessible, reusable, authentic over time, despite changes in technology. Um, and that's a whole area of expertise called digital preservation, digital archiving. And that's my background. That's that's where I built my career. I have two free open source uh, platforms, one called Ar Archive Manica, the other one called Access to Memory. And they're the most widely deployed free and open source um, arch digital archiving platforms in the world. So I bring a lot of that expertise into the blockchain space. And that's one of definitely the lens that I've been looking at the Oracle problem with is like, hey, we're not doing a good enough job like archiving and collecting the data that we need to prove that the facts that we're publishing are in fact authentic, that they're accurate and trustworthy. So the best way to do that and the best lessons that I have from the digital archives world is to create good metadata and good documentation. So what we do for every fact statement that gets published, we actually produce um, an archival standard compliance um, uh, package. It's called BAGA. It's a format um, introduced by the Library of Congress. And it's just a way of bundling your data to make it uh, future-proof and uh, repurposable and readable to other machines or humans later on. So we make sure that every time we publish a fact statement, we bundle all the related data into one of these like archival standards compliant packages, um, which by the way, you can download directly from, um, from Arweave and this Explorer, all it's doing is it, it, and it's sitting there as a little tarball and just open this tarball and letting us look inside. And then the key thing, so like the, um, uh, a bag, it just has some, 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 uh, some uh, conventions for uh, like like this kind of thing, having checksums so you can prove that what's inside your payload, you can check the checksums for it, make sure it's accurate. But here's the payload and that's the data column. And so what you're looking at here is the actual full on fact statement expressed as uh, schema.org JSON LD. Uh, schema.org is the most widely used ubiquitous like markup language in the web two world to make data understandable, readable to other, other systems. It's been used mostly for the most part in SEO for like, uh, making websites more uh, searchable for uh, search engines and so forth. But it's in the meanwhile become this de facto like um, uh, ontology for like expressing almost anything. Um, and so it really is the most ubiquitous, widely used ontology to use to, to mark up our data. And so it has a, um, it has a uh, entity type called claim and because uh, fact checking has become real popular or interesting thing on, on in the web space in the last little while. So there's a whole schema format whole schema markup for like creating a claim record saying what's, what's the claim you're making about something in the real world. So that's the format we're using here. And so as you can see, we're making a claim of um, the, you know, the, the price of ADA. In one case saying it from one side, the price of one ADA is so much in USD. And then the other, if you run the math and do the other way around, then one USD is worth this much. Um, again, that's another price saving measures by putting both those, both those uh, points in the same uh, datum. Um, and then um, some additional information and then it says, okay, what's this claim based on? And we say, well, the claim is based on these uh, messages that we got from um, this like here, uh, Coinbase. So when we went to Coinbase, um, we said, hey, Coinbase, what's the, what's the price of ADA right now? And then this is the actual um, HTTP response we got back from uh, that provider. And here's the one we got back from Kraken um, and here from KuCoin. So again, triangulation principle, we're, we're collecting from three. We're about to um, bump that up to quite a large, lar much larger number than three. Um, but for the intent, all intents and purposes, it, it proves the point that we're collecting data from three independent sources. These are all primary sources. They all buy and sell their own ADA and their own order books. And then we run about, we create a validation record, which says we compare uh, the data we got from the three sources, we normalize it. Um, and then we do, um, well, in this case, for this type of data feed, we run a median value calculation. And here's the, here's the value that we came up with. And here's where those values came from. And all the nodes in our validated network came up with the same answer. So we believe it to be true. Um, and that's, you know, the, one of the mechanisms that we can, that we use to like, um, allow people to trust, but verify. So let's say even somewhere, somewhere along the way, something, um, um, you know, happened that we didn't want a bad actor introduced something somewhere in the flow. Even then we can, we are going to be able to go back and look at these like permanent, uh, immutable r packages to see what, what happened, what data was collected and, and, and at least, uh, put a finger on potentially security holes that might've happened. Um, but I think for the most part, 
It also allows uh, users to trust but verify and go back and look at this data. And what is so super cool and interesting is that right now, these are all just um, JSON LD packages living on rweave.org that are reporting price data. But you can imagine once it starts recording more rich data like sports score data or other kinds of like, you know, human event type data, what we're essentially doing is we're creating a data lake of highly marked up, highly reusable, machine readable um, uh, fact statements that have been like verified and validated in a civil resistant um, decentralized network. Um, and that in and of itself, the secondary value of that is going to be amazingly powerful because like, you know, there's already so many, so much talk about like training AI with reliable facts and all these other things. And so we believe that potentially AI training is, is going to be one uh, potential use case for that data lake that we're creating every time we publish a fact and put it on our weave. So we're pretty excited about that. I think it, it's, it's a nice way to bring the concept home by looking at an explorer like this. Um, I um I think I'm gonna start winding it up here. I mean, there's other things we can talk about. Like there's um we have a utility token. Um so um so we have a right now we have a model where we ourselves are subsidizing this ADA USD price feed and we're we're paying for it every time it gets it gets used, but we will move to a model at some point where and, and it's already happening, clients are coming to us for very specific feeds and we say, Great, you want one of those feeds. Um, you're gonna it's gonna cost you X amount of fact every time you want that published, and you pay that you pay that fee in, in the fact token. Um, that same token is also being used by the validator pool network I mentioned, and um, that's the that's the token they will use to stake and and um, hold their stake for their node, and that's the same token that they will also then be paid for in rewards. And the long term vision for OrgFax is to build a truly 100% decentralized, trustless Oracle network that's going around collecting data figuring out a way to collect money for it, pay for it and publish it um, without uh, and, and run on its own as its own decentralized autonomous organization. So right now, uh, OrcFax is a British Virgin Islands company. I'm the CEO. You know, we are here to launch the, the, the OrcFax network, but it's our purpose and goal is to transition 100% as soon as possible to a fully decentralized organized network that will make all the governance decisions for um, the OrcFax network, including like technical decisions, like which feeds to add, which feeds to retire, you know, what what contractor to hire to do this project and uh, and other kinds of like, you know, um, network kind of st uh, parameters and so forth that will all be handed over to the DAO. Switching to DAO is not easy. Everybody talks about it. Um, so when you say, when is that going to happen? I have myself, I'm high, I have high hopes that we can do this within a two to three year windows is kind of the plan. Um, Okay, so we've got a Twitter feed. Um, if you're not already there, please come follow us. And we have a very active Discord. So if any of this stuff interests you, and you know, and, this, and I haven't, I'm not able to get fully to your question, please pop into Discord. We have a very active team that's answering questions all the time. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so thanks. I think I'll just uh, maybe leave it there and go look at the Q and A and see if there's anything I missed. Um, so. Yeah, so, um, right, sorry, the first, I, I didn't really do a good job of explaining the process. So um, I think, I think the, um, the Sarah, uh, the C-E-R-R-A platform uh, blog post, I think does the best job of walking you through of like, you know, what it is, is like you go, um, you go to a smart contract for that particular data feed and you look at its most current list of ETXOs and you find the most current ETXO for that particular smart contract feed. And then you read the inline datum of that um, particular ETXO. And then that's the datum. And then you take that datum and you put it into your smart contract, ideally within a transaction in that same block. Um, and again, that's that Sarah tutorial and the option uh, demo that I, um, both of which are, I think are linked to in my um, uh, slide deck give you, I think, the best example right now of how you would do that, of actually integrating the Oracle data. Um, and all that said is that, again, I, I said it already, and I'll say it again, is we're working on um, simplifying our online datum even further so that it becomes even easier for um, DAP developers to parse that and not have to go parse a lot of extra data that, um, uh, to get to that data. Um, what kind of support does OrgFax offer to developers? Yeah, so yeah, we... Um, we work closely with, if you're a developer that wants to integrate your Oracle into your DAP, come into our Discord and chat with us and we will get you up and running. Like um, it is right now, it's our number one goal is to get the word out that we're here, um, that we want to talk to developers. Like I said, we, you know, we are in a very much a B2B kind of like platform, right? Like we are like an Oracle is providing a service to another platform that is probably more user facing than us. 
Um, so our most important job right now as a, as a platform that's just launching is to, is to get people, is to get developers using our platform and get their platforms using the OrgFax feeds. So we, yeah, we, we definitely prioritize um, developers that pop into our Discord. And then typically if the discussion gets more serious, then we create a private channel and start, and we work towards a requirements document, a document and then um, potentially look at how or when we're going to pay for this, you know, um, whether it's work that we're able to do ourselves or whether it's work that needs to get funded by a new client or whether, um, whatever. So that's generally the process. Come to Discord, talk to us, then we get more serious, then we do a requirements document, then we figure out how much it's going to cost. Um, but we're actively doing that, I would say, with at least five to 10 projects at the moment. Um, does OrgFax maintain transparency and trustworthiness in this data collection archiving process? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's the thing I'm trying to say, I think we're really proud of is the fact that we do do that, um, is that you will get all those, like, again, the, the, from right from the very first point when, and right now for the ADUSD feed, it goes out and collects, it says, hey, it goes to, goes to Coinbase. It says, hey, Coinbase, what's the price of ADUSD right now? We captured that response in the audit log, um, and you can see it for the other ones as well. So it's not like, you know, a, a lot of oracles right now is that uh, DAP users will subscribe to the Oracle feed and the Oracle will simply, a, a magic data will appear on chain and there is limited to no traceability to go back. Where did that data come from? How did, how did, how did that data arrive here on chain and how can we trust it? And again, that's really the part that myself, as a, my background as an archivist, I really found to be one of the glaring problems with, with oracles and that I tried to resolve by adding this archiving component to it, which then in and of itself becomes its own kind of very interesting platform and opens up other unique opportunities and business opportunities by simply generating good, trustworthy markup data. Um, so I hope I can, I hope I was able to like, at least get that point across that I think we, we believe very strongly that that's very important for, um, oracles to have that kind of like uh, audibility. Um, and I think, again, the other, other point, the main point I just want to make is that I think oracles are really important to decentralizing our ecosystem as a whole, as Cardano ecosystem as a whole, whether it's us or Charlie three or another Oracle, I think DeFi platforms should be using independent decentralized Oracle feeds for their products. And I think the users of those platforms should start holding their hand up and going, Hey guys, where are you getting this data from? It's really nice. This little loan product that I'm, I'm living on, but how do I trust it? How do I trust the data that it's that is that is triggering that loan contract? Is it just you guys? Then can you guys manipulate that data, or can you show us that you're getting it from somewhere else? And you can like, hey, are we getting it from this decentralized Oracle feed? And if you want to go back and check the data that your loan contract is using, you can go to the Explorer and search for the transaction and so forth and so forth. So this is all part of a gradual decentralization of Cardano as a whole, which I believe is the most decentralized L1 blockchain to begin with. And I'm so excited about the future of Cardano. And I'm so excited to be like on, you know, like this kind of core building block project, um, providing some technology and tools to this platform to help further legitimize Cardano as the most decentralized um, L1 blockchain out there. And, you know, I'm quite confident that, you know, I think we're definitely, I mean, the ADA price being a good sign for one thing that, you know, I think we're going to, a lot of people, a lot of us believe we're going to turn the corner on this bear market in 2024. And that Cardano um, is really the sleeping giant of, of Web3. And, um, you know, when that time comes, uh, I think there's going to be a ton of DeFi activity. And, you know, we're really excited to get OrgFax launched up and running and ready for when that when that moment happens so that we can be in the thick of it. Um, so, yeah, that's OrgFax. That's Oracles. Um, I've chatted a long time. I think I answered most questions. Um, I'm not sure if anybody from Cardano Foundation is going to come and interrupt me and tell me to be quiet or whether this... Webinar is now officially over. I don't know. I'm looking for more questions. Um, oh. Okay. It's all wrapped up. <laughs> I wasn't checking my messages. Thanks, everybody.